What we're going to be talking about first is where we left off in our last class, which has to do with the nature of personal identity across time. Um, and Locke has a very influential view on what makes the person the same person over time. And our projector is a little bit off here. Um, actually, just about everything I want is on there, but that obviously looks really weird. Um, is this going to be okay for this, you think? Let's see how this goes. I might try to mess with this over the break as well. Um, so, the first thing to realize when we're getting into this topic is that this is a meaningful question in a lot of, in, in, in more than just a philosophical sense. That it really does make, a, it really does make sense to ask when, what makes someone the same person is a different thing than what, than what makes someone the same human being. So, the question of what makes a person versus what makes a human are different questions. So like in the abortion debate, there really aren't any people that are well informed in the debate who are saying that you know, the unborn is not human. Everybody thinks the unborn is a human being, that it's got human DNA, it's a human creature. The question, one of the questions that's brought up in the ethics of abortion is whether or not, though, the unborn is a person. Personhood is a different feature than humanity. Some humans are not persons, and some persons, at least, could be not human. Um, so, for instance, maybe individuals that are in persisting vegetative states, once again, this would be very contentious, but some people argue are human beings, but they're not persons. Some people, when they get severe mental illnesses or severe dementia, we, we think that they're the same human across time. They don't become different beings. But you might think they're not the same person. That if somebody gets a severe case of dementia or uh, has a severe split personality disorder, that the, the personalities that are d demonstrated or that come out of that one human being are different persons, but not the, they're not the same person. So Locke is approaching this issue, and he's trying to get us to think about what makes for the same human, uh, what makes somebody the same person? And that's kind of an interesting question. And the key to keeping his view straight is recognizing those differences between what makes something the same material body over time? What makes something have the same immaterial soul? And then a third kind of thing that we can track is what makes somebody the same person? So try to keep in your mind these different distinctions. There's the difference between a human being and a person. And that's really the key one to keep separate. So for instance, one other way to get at this, if there are, uh, suppose, something like the Star Trek universe is the same, that our universe happens to be just like that, or very close to it, then there would be Vulcans. Vulcans exist somewhere out there in the, in the, you know, somewhere out there in the universe. Vulcans are not human beings, but they are persons. So a, a person, once again, is different than being a human. Any questions about this initial distinction before I just cruise on, assuming that this makes some sense? Yeah, mm, Bridget? You said like the dual um, personality thing. Right. It's not considered a person, but wouldn't that be like, I mean, like two different persons, but that's still, if you kill that person, it's still killing a, a person, if not multiple. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so in the case of like per multiple personality disorder, the issue would be that there are, it, it maybe you could say not that there, there's one person, but many people. So you could have many persons in one human being. But well, why would that be okay to, I don't know, like not count that as being a, you it would be multiple yeah. persons, but it's still a person, I don't know. In that case, you're right. I mean, they still have the moral status mm -hmm. of a person. So we couldn't just treat them as if they were non-persons. Like, you couldn't just take somebody with multiple personality disorder and say, well, since you got many persons in you, let's just, you know, give you a lethal injection. Like, we can't just... That would be unethical. Mm -hmm. 
Whereas, arguably, in a case of somebody, if it's true, somebody in a persisting vegetative state or an unborn human being is not a person, they don't have the same moral status of persons. And arguably, you could treat them in, in a less than, uh, well, this is sort of ironic, humane way. But, like, for someone in, like, a vegetative state, if they had a personality before and they lost kind of their personality through that, does that... So even if you had one before, you, it doesn't count? Right. I mean, if, if you lose it, then you lose it, right? Mm -hmm. So if, let's say whatever makes gives you a certain moral standing is having a certain feature, like personhood. When you lose personhood, you no longer have that moral standing. Now, you might argue then maybe there's a different criteria for that moral standing. We're not going to get into that in this yeah. class. But that would, that, that's just one way to get motivated into thinking locks on to at least an important distinction here. And if you're really interested in this issue, you should take my metaphysics class because we talk a lot about personal identity across time. Don't we? Yes. <laughs> and we talk about some really crazy stuff too. Yeah. Really cool stuff. <laughs> um, if you got your book, um, look at section nine here. Um, so this is going to be. <coughs> Round three, the three sixty, three sixty two. No, wait. After that, sorry. Three seventy. You're right. That's a. Thank you so much. Um. And for those of y'all that were at the end of last class, we looked at this in groups. Um. What is it that Locke says makes a person the same self over time? What is his word? What's the criteria there? Yeah. Well, wasn't the, the consciousness of the person? So he talks in terms of consciousness. Now, I think it might even be better, because he doesn't just mean... So consciousness, quite literally, would just be like this present state of mind. Obviously, you don't keep this exact present state of mind over time. It changes. But I think what he means is sort of like maybe what we might call a unified consciousness. The fact that this consciousness that you have right now is connected in the right kind of way to your past consciousness, and hopefully will be connected in the right kind of way to future consciousnesses that you will have. And the way that it's connected to the past, of course, is memory. So memory is going to be really important for law. That what makes you, what makes you the same person today that you were maybe five years ago is that you have memories that connect this consciousness to that consciousness. So consciousness is the essential feature that makes somebody the same person across time according to Locke. Um, this gives us a number of implications. That's what a lot of this text is doing in the reading from this point on. Is He's going to go over things that would follow when you accept his view. One is that personal identity is not lost when one's material body is changed. So if you think one view that was out there, and some people hold to a, a more sophisticated version of this today, but is that what makes somebody the same person across time is that they have the same body. But it doesn't take much to realize that if, your if what makes you you is your body, then when your body changes, you wouldn't be the same person. So if you, you know, cut your hair, you lose some weight, you gain some weight, you um, grow a beard or, you know, shave your legs, all those things would be changes in your body and thereby would make you a different person. I just have, like, just a question about that. Like, I think it's lost and harm. That's a change to your material body that would also impact your personal consciousness, I feel like, in some way. Like, mm -hmm. lost and harm would probably have some pretty steep uh, issues. That's right. I mean, think of, I mean, somebody like loses their legs or something real like that. Technically, a change to a body could also be a change to a personal identity. That that would Not change. Vice versa. I think that, so this would be the thing to ask. Would you think that the change would be so radical that you wouldn't be the same person anymore? Like, could it could be. If you lost lower half your body, you definitely would be very different. 
you're going to be very different. The question would be, would, should people no longer like think of you as the same person anymore? So like, people, like give you a new name. Um, <laughs> Like, if you owed debt, would you no longer owe it anymore? If you were married, would you no longer be married? Because that would be a different person. I mean, think that when we think that personal identity is lost, that would be the kind of thing where you might want to say, then you're no longer, if you had debts, for instance, you'd, be no, you'd no longer owe those debts because you didn't incur them. A different person did. If you were married, maybe you should say, if, when personal identity is lost, you're no longer married because, you know, that's a different person altogether. Um, so not just where you would go through a radical change, but such a radical change it would no longer be you or no longer be that person. So if you identify what makes you, you is your body, your material body. When your material body changes, you change. Um, I have never looked into the scientific basis for this, but I've heard something like in a period of like 8 to 12 years, every every single cell in your body is replaced. So, so according to, if that's true, then, pers- then you would no longer be the same person once you trade out every single cell in your body. There's a famous uh, philosophical illustration of this with a boat, which suggests, or, or that I just put before you, if you own like a simple little boat that like you go out into the river and fish from, and let's say it's all made of wood, one day you're in the boat and there's like a bad plank in there. So you decide to pull that out and replace it with a new one. Is that boat the same boat? Most of us want to say, yeah, it's the same boat. You just change it out one board. And the next day another board's squeaky, so you replace it. And the next day another one. You just do this slowly over time where you replace every single board in the boat. Is it now the same boat? Some people are hesitant to, to, one, to say it's the same boat anymore. But some, you might think, look, if I granted the first one, I've got to grant everyone after that, so it's the same boat. But now, suppose I saved all the old boards, and I put them in a little shed, and I reassembled the old boat out of those boards. Which one is the boat? <laughs> that, these are puzzles you have to deal with if you identify personal identity with being just the same material stuff. Because arguably your material body could do the exact same thing that boat does. It'd be it would take some really good biological engineering, but we in principle could do it. Like a clone. Well, imagine we replace one cell with an, another cell, and then we save that cell we just took off, and and then we replace another cell and another, and we just do this like you know however many billions of times we need to do it. Which, what, what is you? Which, is it this body or the one that we just built out of your old cells? Yeah? What about like identical twins? Like they, like they look the same, they basically have the same DNA, but they have different personalities. Does that make sense? So the, on this view, if you want to say what makes them the same is the same material stuff, they, they're, made out of diff, they're made out of different stuff. They're not made out of the exact same thing, right? That's the same thing like if we had two water bottles, like somebody had one of these as well from, uh, that had just bought one. I mean, they're identical, but they're not the same thing. Uh, they're made out of different stuff. But what you're suggesting is more what Locke would say. Well, what makes them different isn't the stuff anyway. What makes them different has to do more with their personality, has to do more with their psychology. So how would that be with someone with bipolar mania, where they're basically constantly changing moods? Hold on to that, because that might be an issue we get to in a moment. Um, Another implication is that, according to Locke, the personal identity could theoretically be preserved across different bodies, meaning you could be the same person in two different bodies if it were possible to transfer consciousness in this way. Now, this is just like a weird science fiction kind of thing, but he's doing this to illustrate a point. Suppose, I think there was a TV show kind of based on this, where when you go to sleep, what if when you go to sleep in this body, you wake up in another one? And you have this exact same memories as you did when you're in this body. When you go to sleep in that one, you wake up in this body. Which body is you? Locke would say it doesn't make sense really to talk about which body is you. You're not a body. He would say what makes you you is that stream of consciousness. And that stream of consciousness can be spread across 
you know, one or two or many bodies, and that's really all that matters. So being the same person for Locke has nothing to do with having the same body or not. It has everything to do with having the same stream of consciousness. Yeah? So <coughs> say you were, you were in an accident and you had like a head injury and you have amnesia, and for say like so many months you, you lose your personality and then it does come back to you. In that time period, were you, would you consider that to be like a different person altogether? According to Locke, yes. And especially, it gets a lot easier if you say you just never recall them. If you never re learn your old memories again, if there's just a clean break, then it's a separate person. Another implication he considers is that it's possible for one soul, or one spirit, one immaterial substance, to host several different persons. This is where he brings up the issue of Castor and Pollux and... Um, and he talks about a guy that he knew who claimed to have the soul of Socrates, to like, you know, like reincarnation. Um, on this view, Locke would not say, suppose reincarnation is true. He doesn't believe in reincarnation, but suppose it were correct. He thinks that that just, like if your soul was reincarnated in someone else, that doesn't make that person you. Or if you, brought, if you inherited... Um, the soul of Napoleon, you would not be Napoleon. Why? Because all that would show is you shared the same soul, the same immaterial substance. But what makes you you has to do with your state of mind, that stream of consciousness. And you and Napoleon don't share the same stream of consciousness even though you share the same soul. Um... So when you think about a soul, all that he's thinking of is like some immaterial, you know, spiritual vehicle or holding space that sort of runs your consciousness. But he's not thinking that a soul by its nature must have consciousness, like the same consciousness. Um, and being the same person, therefore, is not the same as being this. Uh, uh, is not a matter of being the same substance, whether that's an immaterial substance like a soul or a material substance like a body. So, the whole point behind Locke's view of personal identity is not to make personal identity ident be a matter of being made out of the same stuff, whether it's soulish or spiritual stuff or material stuff. The stuff doesn't matter at all for Locke. What matters is whether or not it's the same stream of consciousness. Um, so one of the questions to think about is why can't the same immaterial soul underwrite uh, personal identity over time? Locke points out a few things with this. One is that it would imply that the same soul that hosted two distinct consciousnesses that have no awareness of one another are the same person, which he thinks is crazy. So just because it's the same soul, it wouldn't mean that, that there would be awareness of the same of those two different consciousnesses. So once again, if reincarnation, for instance, were true, um, suppose you happen to have inherited Napoleon's soul. That wouldn't if you're completely unaware of the consciousness that Napoleon had, then there's no then Locke would say it'd be crazy to say you're the same person as Napoleon. How can you be identical with some person of whom you have no awareness of, you know, their stream of consciousness? Um he considers why can't it be the same material body the same material body to underwrite personal identity? Um, he says a few things here. One is that it, it makes an afterlife impossible. Um, it seems one thing to worry about, and in the background here is his, he is a Christian, so he's thinking about resurrection and the afterlife. If what makes you the same person over time is having the exact same body, um, one concern is about cannibals. When a cannibal eat, you know, eats another human being, then part of the body of one person becomes the body of the other. If God resurrects everybody, and in order for them to be the same person, they have to have the same body, who gets those 
material parts. The, the cannibal or the, you know, the guy who was lunch. Um, so, it would be impossible to make an app for an afterlife to work on this kind of model. Um, secondly, without consciousness, all you have is a carcass, that's his phrase. So that if you take consciousness from your body, is that really you? I mean, if your body continued to, to be alive, biologically speaking, would, that still, would you still say that that is what you are? He would want to say, no, all that is is just, you know, a body. It's just carcass. And then my way of talking about this is that, obviously he doesn't refer to this, but it gives the wrong result in Freaky Friday scenarios, you know, where you trade bodies uh, you're, you're with somebody, according to this really bad movie. So, um, it seems, when we think about cases like these Freaky Friday scenarios, and he has his own version of this with the prince and the cobbler, it seems like the way that, that to identify who is the same person is not through their body, it has to do with their consciousness. So that if, in the Freaky Friday stories, it's a mom and a daughter who switch uh, bodies, we, nobody's inclined to think that that daughter is the same person after they switch consciousnesses. Why? Even though she has the exact same body, we think that doesn't make her who she is. What makes her her is her personality, her stream of consciousness, her memory. So, um, for that reason, being the same material body can't make you the same person across time. Now, if Locke is right, you might wonder, he considers this, why do we hold people legally accountable for what they have done when they have completely blacked out, like when they're drunk? Shouldn't we say that those are two separate persons? So he takes this up in section 22. What he says is, yes, on his view, we would get two different persons. But, um, so if there really was a blackout there. However, proving <laughs> that you have absolutely no recollection of, of your consciousness in that case is hard, maybe impossible to prove. So, for the purposes of practicality, the law makes no distinction, although actually there is a, di a difference there. Yeah? <coughs> I just want to know how, that, how there would be a difference, because it's still the same consciousness doing it. It's just doing it a different way than it would normally do it. Like, it's still the same consciousness, just kind of like taking a different path for a certain amount of time. There is a, this is what Locke would say, there is a consciousness there, but it's not the same consciousness that you have now. So if it's completely disconnected by memory from one another, then it's a different person altogether. So he would believe that, like, if somebody were drunk and they acted on their current consciousness, then couldn't recollect what had happened, it was a different, completely different person that had acted on the... Yes. Like okay. So... Here's a kind of case to think about. Um, one thing you can get when you go to have major surgery, they give you um, they give you anesthetics that numb you and that numb the pain. But let's say you can't afford that. They have something else that are called amnesiacs. Amnesiacs are things that they can give you that will cause you to forget the experiences you've had. Suppose you have to get some really painful surgery done and you can't afford the um, anesthesia you know, thanks Obama, then <laughs> what you do instead is you can afford the amnesiac, though. So what they're going to do is they're going to put whoever is going into surgery under intensive pain, but they're going to give you this really powerful drug that causes you to have no memory of it. Locke would say that person who goes into surgery and goes through excruciating pain wasn't you was someone else, some other poor individual that you tortured. Um, why? Because that person, that you have no m connection with memory to that person. If you have no connection of memory with that consciousness, <coughs> it's a completely separate consciousness. That would be very unethical to do, even on Locke's view, but um, 
that's another way to see that he's talking about um, another way to see why consciousness on his view or some of the implications of consciousness being the mark of an individual across time yeah. I read something once where like um, if you like remembered when you were a baby being born you'd like it would just be like, it would be a miserable person like you. Yeah. wouldn't be able to function. I believe it. So, <laughs> well, so does that mean that you're like a different personality when you're, because you don't remember that? This is an objection. You're anticipating the end of all this. But this is one major objection that's brought up by a philosopher named Thomas Reed. We'll get to that. Okay. Um, if you, once again, and this is kind of in line with uh, with also with, with what Kelly brought up, which has to do with mental illnesses. Um, if mental illnesses are so severe that you have completely different like streams of consciousness that are unconnected to one another, where one doesn't remember the other, then by Locke's account, you'd have to say these are different persons. Like this would be like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde almost, where you know I don't know if we should say Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde is like bipolar disorder, but if it was severe enough like that, then yeah, the two ends of the spectrum would be two completely different persons. Yeah. What if someone was like, like uh, hypothetically, you, you brainwash someone and had made them like have like a different thought process, but they had the same memories of that person? So a little bit like Clockwork Orange, kind of. Yeah. Which. Um, I've never seen the movie, so I'd be, uh, based on the book, I would be afraid to watch the movie. But it is kind of a case of like brainwashing somebody to, to change their behavior, change their, their attitudes about certain things. If the memories are still there, even if there's a shift in personality in certain ways, I think Locke would still say it's the same person, because there's continuity of memory. Um, what, would he, what would he view like a substance like alcohol or... Or um, like a drug, like this is gonna sound stupid, but like would he view them as like a person changer? Like, like I like that's what it seems only, like almost. Cause only if it had the power to completely disconnect those consciousnesses. So I mean, of course, a little bit of alcohol doesn't. Right. And even I mean, a good amount of alcohol doesn't. I mean, you have to drink a lot of alcohol to the point where there's like that blackout. Right. Um, so only in those extremes would he say that there is that like sort of person changing going on. Yeah. But even in like a blackout drunk and you still can, uh, through the uh, conversation of, I guess, other people, have like the memories that make up your consciousness. So doesn't that still make you the same person because you still have your past memories? I think this is kind of an interesting case because while you're drunk, you if you have the ability to remember the past, you're still the same person. So there'd be kind of like a forking here. Um, so if you come here, when you get drunk, let's say, this is who you are up here, and you can still remember all your past, but when you wake up, you have no recollection of this little thing, then up here, you're the same person as, as all of this, but when you're here, you're not the same person as the blackout. There might be an interesting puzzle here about how this all really plays out, because you might be wondering who are the distinct persons, but Locke would want to say something like that. Okay. I like to think about this in terms of the Star Trek transporter. Um, I know not everybody in the room will be a fan, but if I were in the world of Star Trek, as I often like to wonder, I would never get in that transport. I would be like Dr. McCoy from the original series who always uses the, the, the shuttle. Why? Because I don't have Locke's view of personal identity. On Locke's view, you could survive the Star Trek transporter. And the Star Trek transporter, what they essentially do is use a high energy beam to annihilate your body. Like your atoms get completely destroyed, like spread out across the universe. But what they do is they take a perfect if you will, scan of your body and then reconstitute your body in another location with that exact same configuration. Now, on Locke's view, you do survive the transporter if, when the new body is constituted, as they do it on the show, 
you have the same stream of consciousness, the same thoughts, beliefs, intentions, and memories, and so on. All that matters to be the same person isn't being the same stuff. It just matters that you continue to have that stream of thought. And the transporter in principle could do that. I've always wondered, because that's all the transporter does, is takes like a scan of like your body and then reconstitute new material to, to create another body just in that state. What would happen if the transporter accidentally, instead of making one thing, created two? That that they did that on an episode. So who would be the original person? Presumably both people can't be the original. Um, I think they've done. Is this where we get good and bad Spock? And I yeah, but I, I was thinking yeah. of Riker when they they made a, a copy of Riker and left him at the base for like seven years. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got. I haven't. I don't recall that. Um, I'll get to that soon. I'm rewatching the Next Generation right now. Bonus points for that. Um, <laughs> so if you cr actually create two copies of the original, by Locke's definition, they would both be the original. But Presumably, they both can't be. Somebody's got, you know... Because once again, if, if you were married, and then you went through the transporter, the original you was annihilated, and two copies of you are made, and both of them have the exact same sort of state of mind, the same memories and personality and so on, which one of them is married to your wife or your husband? You know, if you owed money, which one of those people owes the debt? If you were wanted for a crime, which one of them should be thrown in jail? Um, so, I think this is one kind of problem people raise, is that instantiating that exact same consciousness is in principle possible. Um, another problem to bring up is that, what about young infants who have no memory? So this is related to what you're saying, which is that we don't remember what it was like to be six months old, and thank goodness, having had kids, for one, we do some awful things to them, um, and that, it's really hard. Like, teething is incredibly painful. I mean, you just have bone driving through your skin, you know, to cut through it. I mean, ouch. Um, so, yeah, we don't remember... Uh, we don't have continuity of memory that goes back to being an infant. But it also has the issue of our infant's persons. Um... I think everybody, I hope in this room, would think that taking a young child and ending its life would be immoral. There's a case in the news, it just breaks my heart every time I, I see it, where um, this guy he, recently in this county killed a 10-month-old child, I think. Mm -hmm. He was so cute. And, and, and apparently he was angry and dealing with lots of kids and slammed the 10-month-old down in his bed. and did it too hard and killed him. We think he's done something immoral because he's ended a person's life. On Locke's view, though, how can that be a person if they have no continuity of memory? Um, in a similar kind of vein, one of Locke's contemporaries, Joseph Butler, he wanted to wonder, how do we discern true memories from false ones? And how do false memories impact somebody's own personal identity. Um, these sorts of things come up. I mean, there are famous cases of people who claim to have been molested as children based on memories they recovered in a therapy session or in a, a counseling session. But then later, even, they come back and say, well, maybe that, those, those memories aren't real. How do you discern real memories from false ones? The past is one of those things we have no way of going back and checking. Um, we can't go back to the past and find out if it's true or not. Um, so how do you know that your, your memories that make you the same person across time are correct? Here's a bigger problem. This is the one raised by Thomas Reed. Um, Reed is trying to make sense of Locke's view. So according to Locke's view, yourself at age 30, let's say, is the same person as yourself at age 15, because at age 30 you have that continuity of memory to your life when you're 15 years old. You can still have a, that stream of consciousness is connected by memory. 
and at age 15, you're the same self as you are at age 5. Let's say because at age 15, you have that continuity of memory that goes from uh, 15 to 5. But Locke would say at age 30, you're probably not the same person as you are at age 5 because at age 30, you don't have the continuity of memory to at age 5. But once you grant those three claims, and if, and if we need to change these ages to make it work for you, we can just change it ever so slightly to get that result. But if you grant 1, 2, and 3, you get a contradiction. Because according to 1 and 2, age 30 is identical to age 5. Why? Because if age 30 is identical to age 15, and age 15 is identical to age 5, then by the law of identity, the person at age 30 is identical to the person at age 5. But according to number 3, that's not so. The person at age 30 is not the same person as they are at age 5. Once again, creating kind of a problem here for Locke's view. But Locke's view, as much as there are these weird problems with it, it most philosophers think this is the best thing we've got going. What else makes you the same person across time if not? Something like your consciousness, and maybe by this, this idea of your personality, your memories, your beliefs, um, all of those kinds of things bundled up together. Um, Any questions about Locke's account of personal identity, or really any general issues or, or puzzles about the nature of personal identity? Anybody have any weird what-if cases to deal to think to help us think about to help you understand or challenge Locke's views here? Yeah. So are you saying that your personal identity only is based off like your memories, if you can remember the past? The memory is the most important one to connect you to the past. So, I mean, think about this, like in reincarnation cases, this, and maybe this is where you, people might have different intuitions, but if, let's say, I exhibited all the personality traits of Napoleon Dynamite because I got his soul, but I don't remember anything having to do with Napoleon. Or did I say Napoleon Dynamite? <laughs> <laughs> Napoleon Bonaparte. <laughs> So, <laughs> it's better than mistakes I've made in some of my other classes. So, if I, if I get Napoleon Bonaparte's soul, but I, and I inherit his personality traits, but none of his mem I have no memories of that, there, some people would say that I'm not the same person as him. I would need to remember, you know, his thoughts and his consciousness from back when he existed to be the same person. Other people might say, well, if you really had enough of those personality traits, even if you don't remember, maybe that would be a good case to say it's the same person. I think Locke just has the view that if you're the same person, you've got to remember. It's kind of like the stuff on innate ideas, where he's going to say, if you've got the ideas, then you've got to know them. If you're the same person, you've got access to the, the, that person's consciousness. Yeah? Um, could you go over the objection brought up by... Butler again? I, I was kind of confused on like what he, what was said in that. The main thing with it is just there are if the main criteria is memory, then trying to figure out the nature of memory itself is tied up with personal identity. So if I'm rem so in the case of like false memories, if you and probably all of us have some false memories, things like you remember. I was the best person on my soccer team, <laughs> or um, you know something like that. Where you, and if it come, turns out that's part of like how you think of yourself and who you are as a person. But if in fact you were not, things didn't turn out the way that you remember them now. Then maybe you're not actually connected to your past self in the right way. Um, and then there's just the other issue of then how do you even get down to figuring out when do you have the true memories and the false ones. Because for most things we have, we don't have access to the past. Like, we don't have a videotape or anything like that to go confirm or deny our memories. We just go off our memories. So if, that's, if we have a ton of false memories, how would we ever know that we're that far off? 
So was he disputing the fact that <coughs> um, the self is not based on consciousness for m and memories, it, like for the sake of memory? Or was he just questioning how do we get to these true or false memories? In Butler's case, he's trying to poke holes in Locke's theory because Butler thinks what makes you the same person across time is not memory. Okay, all right. So would that go into someone's perceptions? Say if you think of the past as you're the star of the soccer team, mm -hmm. really you weren't, but you grow up and you live the rest of your life believing that, but in reality you weren't, you know, where does that really come into, like, what is the... Yeah. Like the nurse or the... I think it's even things a little bit even crazier, but but still believable, which are things like, even at the time, let's say we're thinking about like life in middle school, which for me seems like forever ago, not for, for many of you maybe, but I might think, I might now think, you know, when I was in middle school, I was kind of shy, but the girls really did like me. <laughs> but when I was in middle school, let's say my consciousness then did not think that. I didn't think, oh, I'm kind of shy, they all like me. At that time, my thoughts are, nobody likes me, you know, I smell weird. <laughs> if my mem memory of that time doesn't match up with my consciousness at that time, then how can I be the same person on long So it's not just, it'd be different. One way to take what you said would be, I had the false beliefs at the time, and I still have the false beliefs today. Mm -hmm. That would actually still make you the same person on long The issue would be, what if you had true beliefs of yourself then, and you had false beliefs of the way it was back then? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. What about personality, like your personality traits? So usually, as long as it's connected in the right way to where you don't, to where it's all the same. Like, because you can go from having like a shy personality to having a more outspoken one. But as long as it's not like such a shift or a break that you no longer remember, like, the one life or the other, Locke is fine with that. And we tend to think that, at least, it, Gradual changes in personality don't create new persons altogether. Like we do think people can change. Um, and so Locke would want to accommodate the possibility of change for sure. The thing that scares, m well, not scare us, the thing that we get more concerned about are radical changes. Um, and sometimes in marriages and, and in, o in other committed relationships, we say things like when we're breaking up about, you know, you're not the same person that you were when I married you. And there's some one sense in which that's just kind of not literal. We don't literally mean you're a different person, but sometimes we can mean it in a literal way that you are not the same person. And I married one kind of person, you turn into another one, and I don't want to be married to the new one anymore. If you make the so if you make the criteria more about personality, there's actually a sense in which that would be true. If you make the criteria just about memory, uh, Locke probably wouldn't let you get away with saying you're a different person in that case. But these are all really hard issues to to think about. I mean, one of the things we're going to be looking at the last reading for today is concerns about resurrection and the afterlife. Um, Locke was attacked because they thought his view implied atheism, that it implied uh, no immortal soul, so um, a lot of people had to step up and defend him. Any other thoughts? After this, we're, we're done with personal identity. So Her. how does, like, maturity, like, fall into this? What do you mean? Like, the more, like, you grow up, you change. Like... So as long as that the, the changes are connected by continuity of memory, he's going to be cool with that. So as you grow older, you might do new things, you might have new per you might take on new personality traits, He's cool with that as long as there's a sim there's that same stream of consciousness connected through memory. So going back to like a, yeah like that split fork right there on blackboard, when you're in that that fork, you're still a person. Yeah. So effectively, when that ends, that, that person dies. Right? That's that's right. That person ceases <laughs> to exist. That should have more problems, then, especially with the uh, amnesia. You had, yeah, because that's like killing the person. In, indeed. <laughs> so you may have, I mean, for Locke, if each person is just a connected set of memories, 
then any time you, you, through your own actions and your own sort of self, create sort of this bubble of memories that are disconnected, you're essentially creating and ending a person's life. Maybe that's a strange result for his view. That was the basis of the argument for the woman, right, that we were reading about in the last section, that Locke believes that when you're... Because he believed right. that your consciousness would stop when you like went to sleep or something like That's that. Right. She says that you're waking up each day as a completely new person with a new consciousness. And exactly. Then, and then that goes to like, if that were the case, like how does that work? And then Locke would respond by saying, the the soul already has these ideas ingrained into it, and we just react based on like objects. And, and we'll, then, we'll yeah. say more about all that tonight. Yeah, but. that's right. I'm, That's seeing it, I'm seeing it connect now. <laughs> Good. So part of the reason I'm taking the time to go to this, if we don't get this, then what we're doing in the last hour of class will not be as exciting. I know, it's hard to imagine because this class is always so exciting. <laughs> Any final thoughts? This is... We'll pick up personal identity again in our last hour tonight. Um, let's go ahead and take a break, and let's come back in about, let's give it a 11 minutes. So when this clock says 6.31, we shall pick right back up.